thanks a lot for joining in uh, in the second day of the radiology and imaging summit uh, we are uh, going to discuss another important topic in the radiology and healthcare domain and it is radiology radiology education exploring the potential of next gen technology a very uh, important and pertinent topic uh, which needs uh, to be discussed and here we have dr kushaljit singh sodhi vice chairman iria icri professor department of radio diagnosis pgmr chandigarh who is joined us joined us and will be moderating the session uh, thanks dr sodhi uh, for accepting to be the moderator Doc next we have dr malini lavande consultant radiologist nanavati hospital thanks a lot ma'am for joining in dr sumir sethi founder and head delhi academy of medical sciences uh, thanks dr sethi for joining in and uh, we have uh, dr kushal gehlot associate professor radio diagnosis rnt medical college udaipur thanks doctor for joining in and uh, ms meena meera saini gupta senior product sales manager from elsevier to give her thoughts on the topic over to uh, dr sodhi uh, to uh, take on the stage thank you dr sodhi you have to unmute yourself Yeah, thanks for that. I do this every time. Uh, thank you, Pratibha, for uh, the introduction. So we welcome all for this on this wonderful uh, pre-lunch session uh, on radiology education, exploring the potential of next generation technology as a part of ELS uh, Radiology and Imaging Summit. So we have a very interesting topic to hear uh, at our hands um, on radiology education and exploring the potential of next generation technology. Actually. As you are aware, digital inclination of the next generation of younger radiologists, the generation Y and generation Z, as we call them, has led to lots of interesting and new developments in radiology, informatics, and education. Radiology education, as you have seen, has witnessed a sea change in the last decade. We have mobile-based apps, internet sharing, multi-functionality of tablets. web based educational tools coming up virtual and simulated patients based training of radiological procedures and interventions multi institutional case based reviews and video conferencing global web based focus specialty lectures by experts we have seen a plethora of these global web based uh, specialty lectures worldwide now various society run educational talks and conferences run on different zoom google webex platforms and of course a worldwide collaboration of different radiological societies and educational resources for a more comprehensive database of cases and teaching materials these are just some of the ways radiology education has shaped up recently in the last couple of years so as to say and today our endeavor in this panel discussion is going to explore the emerging role of technology driven radiology education and advances that can be specifically useful in radiology training and education in the coming times and to set the ball rolling now uh, i'll be starting with dr malini lavande a consultant radiology at nanavati hospital and innovation imaging and professor kushal gehlo who is a professor and head at um, rnt medical college udaipur dr malni if i may uh, start with you first what do you think is the need actually for starting and incorporating the next generation technology in education today uh good morning everyone thank you very much uh thank you the organizers for this i think it's a very relevant topic as dr sodi said so i think uh for years and years i think it happens all the time we all keep hearing oh our time the education was like this our time the residents were better our time the teaching was better our seniors have said that we say it and i'm sure the next generation is going to say the same thing but when we just look at it yes, there is a clear difference we are talking of gen which i think all of us on the panel belong to and we are the generation who saw the world without internet without tv without mobile phones without the smartphones and then saw development of all these we adapted to it well so our generation is something we all have been uh, independent self reliant we have been resourceful and multitaskers 
because I think that's how we adapted to all these new changes. So for us, what worked was very clear instruction. Classroom-based learning, textbook-based learning, and then we would add on to it our own resources, what we could find in the library. And that structured kind of learning really worked for us. But if we look at the Gen Y and Z, the millennials and the centennials, I'm sure we see our residents now, we see our niece, nephews, our kids, and it's a completely different world. This is the generation of uh, they have a sense of entitlement to things because of the way they've been brought up. They are wired 24 7 continuous information times, all the time on social media. I don't know on the internet. It's like as good as oxygen for all of them, I'm sure. At the same time, they have very high visual learning capabilities, more as compared to us. Small kids start playing. Uh, video games and computer games, which we find it very difficult to get used to. So I think based, and they have a very short attention span. Unlike us, their attention span is quite short. You are flicking through channels. We are from the time when there was only Doordarshan and we didn't have any choice. So I think because of all of this, this is the generation which needs communication and information on demand. You need it, go to Google, search for it, search YouTube, get it stat because of which what worked for us is not going to work for them they need something which is customized to their own needs self paced because their attention span is less they want things at different times when they want it and at the same time more self assessment this this is a generation which does not take well to us trying to push the, our opinions on them so self assessment so all of these things together, I think we've been discussing how we can incorporate technology. And we, since last few years, these discussions have been going on, whether YouTube videos are better or what is better. But now with this pandemic boom, it's right over there. There's no choice. Everything is virtual. We are right now in a virtual conference. So I think it's come now. It's already there with or without choice. And we have the prerogative to now make it good and useful because once there is information overload, there is so much available there. So how do we curate that? How do we get the right kind of data there? The right kind of structured learning is what we need to discuss today. Fair enough. Uh, thank you, Dr. Marley. Uh, Professor Gallaud, if I, may, if I may invite you now. So how do you weigh the pros and cons of this next generation technology and some of the advantages, if you can briefly summarize our audience for this? I think you have to uh, mute, unmute yourself. Sorry, sir. Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yeah. please go ahead. So all we are yeah, yeah. All we sit here and discussing from the various corner of the countries. So itself it is. It's a, high, it's a technology. So it is a big achievement of technology. No doubt there are more pros, no, uh, more mer merits and merits. So in this era, is the uh, cutting edge of the era, the highest technology, the latest technology is a big role. For example, you can see, uh, see the examples of the uh, e-library, uploaded e-library, virtual instructional LEDs, and videos and job ads and webinars. No doubt they definitely benefit well, uh, means the residents and the, our fellows definitely benefited. And we can use, uh, since the in vivo as well as in vitro in facility of, uh, for the, this uh, digital learning platform. For example, uh, I think uh, Siemens Health Near is providing a PEP Connect uh, is uh, one of the software. So we can install and uh, in, inbuilt with the, our workstation. So our resident and the fellows, they can get the, all the information, all the uh, uh, material regarding the st study from the, that the uh, ready, uh, ready to access. And this uh, uh, type of the e-learning and webinars is a very uh, um, much learning experience with the individual profile. They can make their individual profile profile in that PEP Connect. PEP Connect is just it is the actually personalized education and performance experience based uh, uh, software of the uh, health near, Siemens Health So 
they can use uh, using by this facility they can achieve more and more sir if we talking about a uh, demerits of the this uh, online and all we are seeing uh, this online webinars and online studies so what i am thinking then one of the limitation is that uh, in use uh, number of if you are using the use number of the audience then the people usually pay less attention they are not much attentive for that generally you see the that just uh, that uh, mute the video and audio and this is giving the your presence so it's not a ultimate benefit for that and the teachers and speakers they don't know who is actually gaining and who is actually getting or not and since there is no eye contact what i am thinking since there is not eye contact uh, in the large number of audience so i want if we want to do a online or the machine learning then there must be small batches of the students and the fellow it's uh, my opinion sir all right uh, dr galler thank you i guess at the end of the day we have most of our radiology residents and fellows who are very much interested on their own and they have the zeal and passion to learn and most of them are really embracing the next generation technology with open arms uh, i would like to introduce our next panelist dr sumir sumir sethi now he is the founder and head of delhi academy of medical sciences and dr sumir has also been heading leading firms in indian tele radiology solution so he is the right person for this Dr. Sumer, if I might bring you in, and if you can highlight us and enlighten us on the two-way interactions in the video conference, uh, conferencing, and how does uh, what is the role of app-based learning in medical education? Your own experiences on it, sir. Thank you, Dr. Sodi, and thank you to all the previous speakers for enlightening us uh, with a lot of information. Now, what I will share with you is my own experience in 2020. Uh, 2020 has been a year which was unpredicted we, we nobody had an idea there would be a lockdown or there would be a pandemic and we were running an educational institute uh, which has uh, you know we have around 250 branches across the country where there were you know classes happening with the students learning uh, face to face or through uh, satellite based technology and suddenly everything was closed down and one of the most important goal that we had as an organization was to maintain continuity of education for our students and i think you know if we you know look at all the panelists and everybody listening to us everybody as a teacher had a single goal in 2020 was that somehow we should maintain the continuity of education for our students and uh, that is where we had an initiative we started this initiative in 2017 and but we never knew that it would come so handy in 2020 <laughs> and because suddenly 2020 accelerated everything by 5 years i think what was supposed to happen in 2024 in e learning is happening today and uh, we used our app emedicos in this app we developed two way video conferencing solution which could be run batch by batch and uh, like dr gelot rightly pointed out that if we have a mass delivery you know individual attention doesn't happen so we could do video conferencing multiple channels on our app we could go batch by batch and uh, with this uh, two way interaction with the students who had a chat box they had tools like polls they could vote they could uh, you know comment I, I you know I'll take the permission of the organizers if they could allow me to share my screen I I want to you know show one or two episodes of this uh, journey that we had in the last year of e learning I, I, let me see if I can share my screen okay. uh, I hope you are able to see my screen here uh, is, is everybody able to see? Yeah, yeah okay so uh, this is the window that we created this is the landscape mode of our app now what we could do was that we started off with necessity that we are trying to you know plug the gap in information but then we became more creative now with technology we suddenly had an advantage that if i'm teaching to a medical student or a resident we could give him multiple perspective so in front of you in a screen we have a pathologist a radiologist a cardiologist a physiologist a pharmacologist and now what i wanted to add here is that technology opened this window that you know earlier i you know we could never have had you know such a session where 10 people 5 uh, people seven people are teaching together now we we got this opportunity to somehow you know you know put multiple educators also together and the second thing that i felt was enlightening for us this year was the chat box 
the students in a classroom they not only want to listen to the teacher they want to talk to each other also so the chat box started by you know teachers as jo people asking questions to the teachers and then it went on to students interacting amongst themselves so i think that was one of the you know things that we did this year so we could actually mark things there could be a you know we could use a chat box with you know interactions and polls i i feel that this is uh, something which is it just you know allow me to stop my screen i feel this is something which is going to stay uh, this uh, the technology that has happened right now is not just a pandemic solution it is it is now going to stay now when i look back in the same event that we are talking today i think one year or two year back i would have you know and i'm sure all of the panelists would agree we would have traveled to talk 15 minutes so we would have actually traveled maybe 3 hours 4 hours or you know sat waited for our turns we would have had coffee you know so we, we would do this in a five star hotel but suddenly we are doing it right now online at the comfort of our homes or offices or clinics i think it's going to stay i think the two way video conferencing is going to be the key theme going forward but key is two way so even if you're delivering mass you have to have some how mechanism of individual interactions that is my two points into it thank you sir all right uh, thank you dr sumit uh moving on we also have miss meera gupta with us from new delhi today who is this uh, senior product sales manager from elsewhere miss meera uh, welcome broad i would like to uh, request you if you could provide us with a perspective as to what elsewhere as a publishing house is doing in terms of uh, next generation te technology and how it is helping our radiology residents and fellows in radiology education today miss meera thank please you. Thank you, Dr. Sodhi. Um, Dr. Sumey, that was quite an interesting uh, story. And I, I always say, I think the coronavirus has actually made the world smaller because, you know, we're so easily able to access people, whereas in the past, it used to take us a long time to travel and uh, plan these meetings. Um, so I'm going to just give a little bit of an uh, update on what Elsevier is doing. So as all of you know, Elsevier is a, um, we're very close to education. We're a leading provider of books and journals in medicine, starting with the foundational uh, books such as Grace, Grey's Anatomy to the leading journals like Lancet and Cell. And even in radiology, we have uh, a lot of books and journals like the Diagnostic Imaging Series that we're constantly updating and publishing, Sutton's textbooks, Alice and the Grangers, and the list goes on. Um, however, in the past two decades, we've actually been investing a lot in technology to harness all this strength that we have in content and create solutions that will empower our customers with tools so that you guys can do your jobs better. So we have actually now, we don't call ourselves a publisher. We've actually moved from being a pure publisher to an information analytics business. So um, what this means, in, and I'm going to focus on clinical care really quickly, and I'm, I'm going to talk about this evolution that we've done. And I like to think of it as having been done in three steps. So we call it from reading to searching and then to doing. So reading is simply basically taking the books and journals and digitizing them in e-form so you can read them accessible anywhere. Uh, search goes a bit further, and it actually brings uh, this learning to the point of care. So basically, we've used smart algorithms to create a powerful search engine in the back end. And uh, what we have is a, um, a product in radiology called StatDX, which uses this smart search tool to provide you with the in right information at the right time. So here, um, it's, it's important to know. So radiology is basically such a broad um, um, discipline. It covers all the different disciplines. And you also know that there is no typical case. Radiology is part art, part science. So no, no one solution case is going to be very, very typical. So what this solution allows you to do is uh, when you're looking at a case, you can do your search and really understand all the possible scenarios that are, uh, that are possible in doing your diagnosis. And um, basically, you want to make sure that you're looking at everything so that you're doing a thorough analysis and resulting in a very confident diagnosis. So uh, we've actually done some studies and it shows that using decision support tools such as these uh, reduces your diagnostic error by 19%. And if you're a newer radiologist and you're still learning, it actually reduces it by as much as 24%. So it's really, really powerful and a great example of how technology has been able to really help uh, accelerate learning at the point of care. 
Um, really quickly, the final thing is um, this third, which I call doing, and that is active clinical decision support. So this will take it f further. So for example, if you have, um, um, say, a pulmonary uh, mass in the lung, you know that it's either a, you know, uh, it could be a cancer or it could be a uh, infection. Uh, in very rare cases, it could also be things like an arter arterial uh, venous malformation. However, an active clinical decision support tool will actually take information from the patient and say, okay, this patient is actually a 52-year-old smoker, so likely it's cancer. So it's basically personalizing um, recommendations based on the data it's gathering. So this is um, what um, Elsevier is doing, basically taking um, technology and developing tools so that you know you can be more efficient and more accurate and um, save time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mira. Thanks a lot for that uh, perspective. I, I will come back to you shortly. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I would like to go to Dr. Marlene Lewandi again. Ma'am, if you could uh, enrich us by various methods, which you think just three or four topmost methods in your own uh, viewpoint or experience by which you think we can really put on the next generation on. Uh, so again, exactly kind of uh, what Dr. Sumani Sethi already said, what was going to happen in future, which we had been discussing, working on, is already there now. And from my own personal experience, two examples. Uh, so as in one, uh, my colleague Aditya and I, he's the one who's more tech savvy, half of our uh, team, and I'm the one who takes a little more time accepting these things. But then, yes, once I've accepted that I'm into it, it takes some time. So initially, we had we used to run something called as a bone club. And it was very old fashioned. It used to be run in the Tata Hospital Auditorium. We used to send out emails to a large group of radiology residents. It was free teaching for radiologists. We would call various uh, senior uh, radiology uh, teachers to come and teach. And uh, we would send SMSs to all the HODs, please inform your residents. And like that, we built uh, every time about um, 100 or so people would be attending. Slowly, obviously, that all got kind of phased out. And then it became one WhatsApp group and everybody's sending to everyone. You just tell your fellow and they are sending it out to like a uh, thousand groups that they are part of. And then slowly it started changing to webinar. And now with the pandemic, it's completely webinar based. And other thing is similarly, Nanavati Hospital weekly, I have a teaching session for my uh, residents, which has been going on for years. Now, because of the pandemic, most of the times we are working from home. So again, the same the same weekly session, they put it out and now we have people from all over India attending. Any resident is free to attend. So whoever is free that time, whoever gets info, they join. It. So that whole accessibility with respect to time, with respect to location doesn't matter anymore at all. So I think uh, the webinars with provided we make it more interactive. Like Dr. Gallot said, if we just keep it still in the old fashioned way as a lecture, it's not going to work for long. But if we modify it to like what Dr. Sume said, the chat box much more, I'm sure we can come up with more improvements in this, web-based apps, social media, it could be uh, short YouTube videos where somebody can just whatever they want access it. Dr. Gellert spoke of the pep connect kind of thing where uh, each person can access the information they need when they want it at their own pace. I think that is what is going to really make a difference. Yes. Sir. True. Uh, thank you, Dr. Marley. If I uh, my my uh, my add my own experience at PJ here. So what we do now, I mean, this has happened more actually because of COVID nineteen. As Dr. Sumer also said, we have kind of uh, fast paced ourselves now. So now we have a WhatsApp group. I mean, it's my own WhatsApp group. So I have put two exam going resident batches in it. So on a fixed day of the week. So usually I do it on Friday mornings. I put a spotter or a case. So we have two exam going batches. So you roughly seven to eight in one batch. So only those are allowed for the time being. And we just, I just throw a spotter on Friday morning and they have the whole day to look at it whenever they get the time. Or on Friday night, I usually give the answers and kind of, you know, why this is the correct answer and why not some of the responses are correct. So this is a, one of the more simpler and cheaper versions in our daily practice. This is, of course, a much smaller than just a WhatsApp group for residents, as opposed to webinars, which you have rightly uh, pointed out. Uh, we also have a lot of um, artificial 
teaching programs or sim virtual simulation models nowadays coming up specifically on uh, interventional uh, radiology suites. Our department has one in TGI. I'm sure many other institutes have as one. And I would request Dr. Kushal Gehlo to highlight a little bit on this. And I think that uh, Ms. Meera also had a point on that. Dr. Kushal first and uh, Meera later on. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So actually, when we are talking about the virtual simulators, there are many types of uh, NGO simulators and as well as the ultrasound simulators. First, we talk about the NGO simulators. Actually, these are the most important and tools uh, to train our residents and the fellow in our department. So uh, these NGO simulators, they have uh, various modules. They, they have inbuilt modules with the peripheral NGO, cerebral NGO, coronary NGO, and eh? aortic angiogram. So these important tools, uh, just I, I think uh, Symbionix uh, also providing an NGO mentor with the NGO mentor name. NGO mentor full suit is uh, comprising of uh, near complete virtual uh, angiography suit. And it helps uh, well all the procedural steps to knowing and it can customize the whole anatomy. We can add different pathology in that. We can, uh, we can add various complications, already customized complications. We can edit the patient detail. In this way, we can learn a lot without uh, uh, giving a patient uh, hurting or without uh, uh, on the actual patient or without uh, giving the damage to the patient. We can learn offline, at least offline. On the I think there is some uh, streaming issue or some local uh, connectivity issue, perhaps. Now, this is one of one of the things we can possibly say, perhaps a limitation for the next generation technology. It's obviously dependent on a good uh, Wi-Fi system or internet or broadband system. And if, if you have a webinar going, sometimes this thing can actually happen. So nowadays, what we're actually seeing in, in the inter many international teaching programs, we have pre-recorded lectures. Especially if you have one of the lectures from US speaking at one hour and from somebody from Australia at the other time. So the time zones are different. So you can actually pre record the lectures or the teaching sessions to avoid this kind of a thing. And just to take it forward before Dr. Kushal Gallot again joins us. So this uh, virtual simulation models or the simulator uh, teaching program is very important because of a very simple reason. For example, you are, suppose I'm a first year resident. I've just joined uh, imaging or MD or DNB radiology three years course. Uh, I'm just in uh, the, my first posting in this orientation or plane radiograph or x-rays, right? In the meanwhile, I have not as yet been exposed to ultrasound or interventions. So you have actually have hands-on kind of a artificial ultrasound packages or training program for abdomen, for chest, for brain, and for linear probes and all kind of teaching modules are there actually, which are practically structured programs based on ultrasound as well as intervention. You can actually, as far as interventions are concerned, I've seen a few of them and you can have proper uh, structured training program, how to do cannulation, how to take your guide wire, which guide wire to choose, how much to go ahead, you know, and it actually takes, shows you the dry run of a contrast angiogram as well. So that is a great learning example, which is coming up uh, with the advent and uh, more advancing te technology nowadays. Uh, coming back to Dr. Sumer, uh, we would like to hear something about app-based learning as well. I mean, webinars is one thing, teaching program is one thing. What about app-based learning? Just having some apps on some particular things. What, what is your own experience in this? And something about which we can uh, perhaps imbibe in our, uh, for our radiology residents and fellows. Sumer? Sir. sir, thank you, sir. Sir, what I have learned is that in app based learning, there are like, there we have like a uh, balance between two things comfort as well as interactivity. Like, uh, for example, like if suppose a event is happening in America, definitely the time zone will be different. But if I attend it live, I have the, you know, the luxury or the, you know, the advantage of interacting. You can, you know, uh, interact in the live polls that are going on or you can chat or you, know, you have the interactivity. But then you have the comfort of video on demand. 
that if you have you miss out something because of different problems you have that video on demand so video on demand is a comfort but it is it, it often uh, what i have learned in the last one year is I, I don't know what is the experience of other speakers is i tend to procrastinate if there is a video that is downloaded in my phone i tend to say okay, okay i will see it in the afternoon after my ultrasounds of the morning are over then i think that okay i'm tired i'll see it in the night then i think okay i'll see it tomorrow and by the time uh, the 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 validity of the program itself gets over and i have not seen the recorded video at all so <laughs> i don't know because I, I so what i believe is that narrow balance so interactivity is the key word i think if we don't build an interactivity into our app based learning tool then it becomes uh, it becomes uh, you know dependent on the will power of the student and like dr malini already pointed out that uh, the current generation it, it, it is like they, they want everything very very fast they they can't like uh, you can't have them to say that in discipline that 9 9:30 you will put on the recorded lecture they will not they will postpone it so that is thing second thing is visualization i just you know would share a screen and I, I, some tiny experiments that we did this year i'll just uh, you know share my screen for them. so one of the things that we did this year was like uh, we had first year mbbs students with us way who were are, are you able to see my screen let's see are you able to uh, am i able to share my screen or not not as yet i think i am but the host can the host allow me to share the screen uh, okay i don't know because it is saying shared okay maybe i'll try again Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, any anybody from the e-health team? If uh, somebody is around. Oh, okay. Okay. So one of the things that we tried was I actually uh, is can, can I share my screen, uh, Pratibha? The visual itself is interesting actually. what we did was actually was that we, uh, the first year mbba student this year had not gone to the dissection hall at all so we tried two things to show them we we actually got our faculty member to use the uh, actual set of bones and we showed them the bone like you know dr malini mentioned the bone club so we did a bone club for the undergraduate so we okay i think uh, unable to say okay and second thing that we did was we used uh, some 3d models to do improve the visualization of brain and uh, i wanted to share it but uh, unfortunately i am unable to share it right now but once we get it i'll show it to you third thing i have used is social media and i wanted to point out this at this juncture itself that in my own experience uh, i have used uh, like as early as 2004 before the advent of facebook i started using blogs to share cases which was much faster than a traditional journal publication and that was before the whatsapp era so i started a blog in 2004 and I, the beauty of this is that we formed community of medical bloggers across the world in 2004 and which also had dr bhavin uh, jankari from uh, india uh, our you know respected bhavin jankari all of you know so we i i you know so i i did not know him i like that was like 16 years back but because he was blogging i was blogging we could connect into a, a, a say kind of a community and i see similar communities happening after every event today and uh, like with a hashtag in twitter hashtag facebook we all connect and we all express our views about the talk and what we are learning after. so i think we need to look at education as a continuum a uh, uh, physical delivery methods would definitely be there is there is no uh, replacement of you know meeting people shaking hand having a coffee i, I miss the coffees in between in the break so i think that would they be there but there will be a lot more audience joining from remote locations in future through apps and each event would have a separate app uh, this is what i feel each event like uh, rsna or big events would always have their own apps and they would live stream on the app itself and uh, Deepak, I am now sharing my screen again. Uh, if it works, I'll do this. Okay. 
I okay let me try it again okay I think now it was sharing did it come okay yes so this was the bone club that we were talking about and we we helped a lot of students to you know visualize bones when the pandemic did not allow them to go to the medical college and this is how we taught the brain anatomy to the first year students this is just a beginning of using like a bit of a uh, augmented reality thing the bit of it just a bit of it we started with the you know how to tell them that okay brain is a three dimensional structure then we went on to show them the ct scans and we ended up actually getting a special mention by pm modi in the app innovation challenge about our app this year and so i just wanted to showcase the power of if we add apps to social media now 8.4 million people have visited my blog in the last 16 years now and if i look at the people from this is the kind of you know places that we, this traffic is coming to my blog and I started a radiology resident club on Facebook and uh, we are today at 32,000 members and uh, with members from all the countries like India, Pakistan, Egypt, uh, UAE, US, everywhere. So uh, my uh, understanding is, uh, although, you know, with, uh, you know, with the esteemed panel today is that, you know, we are all, you know, as teachers, we are all trying our bit to deliver. And, you know, I would, you know, it is like I'm totally so excited when Dr. Sodhi says that he is teaching his residents. So, you know, I, I would say, sir, why not, you know, increase that reach? Why limit to, you know, your residents? Teach everybody, sir. Everybody would want to learn from you. So I think that is the power of technology, social media put in. We can disseminate massively. Sure, Dr. Sumit. Thank you so much. Uh for enriching us on that. Uh, Dr. Kushal Gallot has joined us and he was talking on um, virtual simulation. Uh, could you push it? Dr. Kushal, you can, uh, we did talk about and did cover a part of ultrasound as well, but you can take over now and then I'm going to request Mira also to join in after you end for simulation in, in training from elsewhere as well. Yes, sir, yes. So first, uh, Dr. Sumesh said, yes. So Dr. Sumesh connect, communicate and be a part of social learning. Yes, sir, I agree with you. 110 percent uh, sir if we talk about the ultrasound simulator it is actually hands-on solution for the ultrasonography hands-on training solution of the ultrasonography and it ultimately save the faculty time as i feel it ultimately save the faculty time and if we talk about the latest simulator this latest simulator this advanced simulator then we can scan then we can do what what we can do we can scan our patient then upload our that scanned patient to that simulator. Then we can train our resident on that particular case remotely, anytime, anywhere. So it is very useful tool. It is a, I think it is a coming, uh, we are not uh, using, but uh, in most of institute it may have come. So in this condition, we can see the, our actual patient remotely. And we can train our patient remotely and whenever we want with uh, and saving our uh, faculty time also so this simulator can also use during the cmes also and without any uh, problems of uh, pndt and i i think so uh, there may might be uh, no foundation for the pc pndt for the this uh, us simulator this is the virtual simulator okay so what i feel it must be a integral part of the each and every department because and the resident and for the resident and the fellow training sir hello sir. all right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. thank so you it, thank it, you dr gallo yeah. yes yeah, so to take this up further uh, actually i have seen a few of them uh, it also has uh, cases uh, kind of fixed in it for example it first shows you a normal anatomy of a liver and it, it, uh, along with segmental anatomy and then it, uh, the virtual simulation, as far as ultrasound is concerned, has cases uh, kind of lined up. So it actually shows you what are the imaging findings in carcinoma, gallbladder, or cholelithiasis, or hepatic, uh, you know, liver cirrhosis. So all these cases are also kind of already loaded onto there. So it's a good teaching program or teaching exercise if, if the resident can spend some time on it. All right, uh, Miss Mira, your role. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I'm actually going to uh, move away from the simulators right now and just talk about a little bit about what uh, Elsevier is doing in terms of uh, radiology education. So we um, are, and it's, there was a question asked about um, informatics uh, in radiology. So we've actually taken backend in analytics and created a radiology curriculum, uh, an online curriculum. It's a solution called Rat Primer. Basically, it helps objectify learning. So it adds to what the faculty can do by giving uh, very simple bulleted lessons. And uh, what uh, people who use it say is that, you know, it basically takes content from various sources and compiles it into one. So for the resident, it's really, really easy because it's available online. So you can be in the hospital or if you're dri driving home or at home, you can look at it on your tablet or a mobile phone. All the lessons are, and this is where it gets powerful with the back end, each lesson is combined or coupled with questions. So when you're reading a lesson, you're learning it, but your learning gets enhanced when you're able to ask yourself questions. And these are case-based questions, multiple choice. So you get on, you get your um, answers immediately. If it's wrong, you're able to get back into the reading material at the click of a button. And then the backend analytics helps you understand or see trends. And for the faculty, it's really great because the faculty can then compare, uh, you know, the performance of all the residents and then see trends and say, okay, this is a place where you know, people are weak. Let me focus on these lessons. So that's a very um, in a powerful tool. And obviously, in the COVID pandemic, this virtual learning platform has actually seen a big uptake. Um, but a, a simple way of, you know, um, objectifying and helping residents learn. The second thing I wanted to talk about is our, um, uh, we have recently uh, launched what's what we call Complete Anatomy. It is basically a 3D anatomy platform. And if I can um, take the liberty of sharing, it's a one minute video. Uh, we have a radiology module. I just want to preempt it by saying that this um, is actually uh, relevant for first year medical students. So it may not be for radiology residents yet, but uh, it is really, really powerful. So um, I will just uh, share the screen. I hope you can see this. Yes, yes. So that's that's basically what I wanted to show you. Um, we are continuing uh, more investments. We are looking at uh, things like VR, virtual uh, augmented reality, and all. So um, stay tuned for further things. All right. Thank you, Mila. That was quite interesting, the simulation in training and the anatomies and the 3D anatomy perspective for the medical residents. I'm sure this would be quite useful for the radiology residents as well. Because a lot of anatomy for a, specifically for a, a radiology resident, a lot of anatomy is actually required in our daily practice as well. So yeah, we got I, a. I, uh, I, I would just I would just add to that. So in my previous life, I used to work for Medtronic, and all my um, uh, neurovascular imaging I've learned using this product, and it is really really it makes it so easy, and you know you're more confident when you're talking to uh, advanced people like that. So yes, I agree. Sure. Okay. So. Um, we have listened to all of our panelists. So we got a, one of the uh, question from the audience, which has been already been partly answered by Mira. What are the next uh, immediate developments within radiology informatics, which may have a significant impact on the education and training of radiologists in the near future? Uh, Dr. Marley and Sumer, would you like to take this up? So I think first, uh, 
before anything uh, sumer your blog was kind of the first radiology blog that we read as soon kind of when we were just out of our training and that time it was a very exciting thing i still remember we didn't have our phones we didn't have computers at home so you would go to the internet cafe to read that and to take part in the rf quiz dr bhavin jankaria would have this quiz so every week you answer and then at the end you would uh, the prize winner would be announced so you would go to this internet cafe to be able to do this which was a very exciting thing uh and amira that was really awesome i can kind of just imagine like as our kids don't know how a tv without remote could ever be there so same way i think the next generation is not going to know how we looked at anatomy atlases and searched for the page and that particular uh, thing what you showed was i can just imagine and i wish it was there when we were uh, learning it would have made life much simpler uh coming to this question as to how it's going to change so not talking about the technological aspects of it i think the uh one very important change which is bound to come and should come i think is ensuring the minimal level of competence right now radiology education across the country is very very we all know that due to various factors it's the availability of cases some hospital may be purely and more of an onco setup you don't have much of ops gynae work you have a hospital where there's not much of an emergency work uh teaching faculty again now that super specialization is happening i personally do only musculoskeletal imaging so now i am not doing the i don't know much about chest imaging i don't know much about other uh so it's kind of limiting what each faculty is able to teach and not all hospitals have all the sub specialty uh, training so that i think ensuring that minimal level of competence is where technology can make all the difference so fine you don't have much of emergency radiology in hospital you can have a database you can have these uh, uh, apps these uh, kind of situations which can make sure that everyone can have access to uniform learning i think that uniformity can be uh, it's finally possible now to do it other thing would be earlier the learning would be limited to conferences okay i take a 3 day leave attend a conference and it's really difficult so much of data in 3 days post lunch most of us are sleepy uh, all the time after a heavy lunch it's difficult to take in all that data now you can have it self paced at your time and again choice so i think it is a uh, continuous learning but with your own choice like sumer said he is kind who will procrastinate and would want a different i am the kind of person who would want a structured thing telling me day 1 watch this video day 2 watch this video i would like to follow that somebody else may say no i want to be free to do what so the ability to choose and do it continuously not limited to conferences not limited to taking a few months off your work to go and learn something new or say cardiac mri i want to learn i people would usually take 6 months off so that part would completely change you will get to do what you want when you want to do it and choose the way you want to do it so mere over to you so oh, i i just uh, i'd like to add a line here this just because of my experience as a teacher as well as my uh, radiologist over the years is number one is that we have now moved to an era of oligemia to plethora I, i just want to uh, translate it in english for the non radiologist listening to us that when i was doing my post graduation we had very little information that is oligemia with too too little information like suppose if i was looking at a x ray chest and i had a doubt uh, i'm i'm not you know lying i'm not exaggerating i'm telling the truth i used to stand outside my professor's room and the professor was always busy they would say and they would often ignore us also first second year residents you know they say wait wait and you would wait with that x-ray from now you have you know you can't go back also because you are now outside your professor's room so you would stand there for half an hour 45 minutes till the time sir or madam would invite you inside and then you ask and then they would tell you what is this opacity looking like and today the residents are taking a picture sharing on the whatsapp group getting opinions here and there and you know things are moving very fast so uh, technology is a great enab- enabler but another thing that has come out of it is plethora now there are so many resources and you know so many conferences so many events happening so many webinars happening so uh intelligent so we again we would now the skill would be like for our time the skill was to find where are the resources now the problem is what are the resources that i should look at and what are the things that i can avoid and i can live my normal life otherwise also so i think the balance between this would be the key in the future in this domain
Sure, that is so so true. I am reminded of my own residency days as well. And there's another uh, challenge, if I might add, for the relatively old titles. We are like in the middle zone, neither too young nor too old, I would say, to embrace the ch rapidly changing uh, technology, I would say. There's so many different apps, so many different websites, so many meetings and conferences. So you really have to keep up the pace up to it. We have another uh, question in the chat box here. Uh, this we have also partly already covered. The question is, can you elaborate on ultrasound virtual training and what will be the extent of impact on this uh, modality? I think we have more or less covered this already. Uh, ultrasound virtual training, we have a fixed, as Dr. Kushal Kalwar also described in detail. We have very fixed structured training program, which gives you kind of a hand on exp hands on experience, almost like the real uh, doing the real scan and uh, gives you a good teaching exercise also. So it's a good learning exercise and it really impacts the uh, training programs as far as ultrasound is concerned. Uh, the other question is, does virtual learning offer the same level of engagement as on-site learning? And would this affect the quality of learning? Uh, Dr. Gallo, would you like to take this? Dr. Gallot, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. Can you? Yeah. Yeah, Andy, yes. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, so online learning uh, by the UG simulator actually it, uh, can't replace the on-site uh, UG training, but this is one of the important tools. So we can save our time, and as I already said that we can upload our the scanned uh, patient data on, on this particular uh, virtual simulator. This is actually online uh, cloud-based simulator is also there. So we can uh, send the data to another site and we can get the information from the expert remotely situated. So definitely we can't replace this totally that the on-site, uh, as we know, there's a, some type of eye contact is there and what we can gain one to one or the teachers one is to one ratio in ratio we can get the information and the learning from a particular teacher on on site we can't learn from the particular uc simulator but we can spare the time and uh, uh, it's partly replace that thing as i think it partly replaces not completely replace the on site uh, training so as uh, uh, dr malini may, may have experienced we are uh, doing a lot of the workshop on the msk and the on site uh, and on the patient so uh, can you think ma'am we can replace it by the UG simulator no can't be so these are very minor things so we can't uh, yet uh, till time explore on the UG simulators right sir so can i, yeah. can I add so i yeah, yeah, one so thing, sir one thing that i've learned is that sir when i'm taking a physical classroom and i'm teaching in a physical classroom for one hour so the students stay in the classroom for one hour you know you're teaching them but what I've learned on the virtual platform is when we analyze the data. So suppose uh, you know 500 students join the event. In between, it would be 350. Then it would be 450 uh, for various reasons. One of them could be internet connectivity. I don't deny that. But another is sometimes the students in between they go off to take a cup of coffee. They move on. Their you know mom is calling. Their girlfriend is calling. So they are distracted. So the engagement in virtual education is not easy. And uh, I think uh, in a physical classroom for one hour, they would not go out because they had they see other people sitting around. They don't want to walk out with a phone every time. They feel shy of the teacher also. So I think engagement is much more in a uh, real, uh, real human to human teaching. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, just uh, one thing if I would like to add here. Uh, I agree with Sumer completely. Uh, but having said that, also there are sometimes advantages because personal experience in a real class, uh, when you ask somebody a question, nobody wants to answer. Sometimes you have to literally, I joke, I tell my residents, it's like as if some torture chamber, you have to like make them, okay, next what? Keep asking leading questions and make them say the answer. But at the same time, what I realize now with this virtual teaching uh, and also with all this polling thing, everyone wants to participate, maybe because they're an anonymous. So they want to participate. You get to know where exactly the thought process is going. So that kind of participation, people are more comfortable in a virtual environment than real. Yeah, I agree completely, Dr. Marley. We have so many of the, uh, I would say, let's say shy or introvert residents who really don't come up, you know, they don't really want to answer because most of the time the residents feel 
maybe if i'm wrong then it might not look good you know so but in a virtual world whether it's a whatsapp or group or any other way the media where they're answering they're more open to answering questions and asking asking questions also many times you would also notice the residents don't really ask questions in the class you know whatever you ask two or three would all would always be there but the bulk of it they will you know ask each other or go to the net so they're kind of hesitant but in this virtual world they are more open to asking questions and raising doubts as well reasons you know so this kind of expertise which is available obviously cannot be replicated by this online world but we are reaching there slowly and it is really changing the world and changing the world of teachers as well as residents not to um, miss meera had raised her hand yes meera yeah i was just also going to add that uh, in terms of the quality you're also reaching out to a lot more people so like dr sumer if you can do one class with 500 people that's not possible so there's a you know that balance as well so i think that's the power of technology to you know standardize education and reach a lot more and maybe get international speakers that you couldn't yeah and i i also agree with the earlier thoughts expressed by most of the speakers that covid has really pushed up us in the scientific arena much earlier you know now we have so many things and we are, we are aware that we are, we can do a lot of things online off site and in person is not required specifically the teaching programs so i'm sure the life for the residents and fellows would be a lot easier than used to be in our times of in the era before so i think we are coming at an end to the time and i would like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers elets for organizing a wonderful uh, radiology imaging summit and specifically having chosen this important topic of uh, next generation uh, technology and i would like to thank uh, dr ravi gupta deepak uh, and pratibha of course for knitting the whole thing together uh, for pratibha you can you, know, you can take it over from now and thanks to ms meera dr malini dr kushal dr sumer as well right thanks a lot dr sodhi and uh, i was also uh, like you know taken back to my school days uh, though i am not a radio Sorry, you're just a doctor. It was a very nice session, uh, uh, particularly when uh, the pandemic has locked down for six months and everybody is in the virtual world, literally. So, uh, thanks to all the panelists. year for taking out time and giving us their views on this such important topic and uh, we would like to uh, give a speaker certificate to all our panelists here uh, can i ask my uh, it team to for this uh, so thank you lot for yeah. so oh, okay thank you thanks a lot dr sodhi for making it and you know moderating it so well and dr malini for participating from bombay and you know giving your thoughts and dr sumer sethi for that ppt presentation and it was really nice your thoughts were really deep yeah deep insights there and dr kushal uh, gelot from uh, udaipur and dr meera saidi gupta thanks a lot thanks a lot to each one All right. Uh, thank you, Pratibha. And I will request you to send the certificates by email to all the panelists as well. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. We will be so, WhatsApping yes. and uh, sending the certificates to y'all uh, via mail. We have tweeted uh, your quotes as well. Uh, you can see that in the social media, and you can reshare it. Thanks a lot. Thank all you. Right. So. Thank you. Thank you thank all. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Everyone.